Okay. Captain Ryan Farner, I have known since he was about this big. He's been fishing a long time. I fished with his dad, Terry. Ryan has a brother, twin brother. You and Kevin twins? No, they look him. almost just alike. He has a brother named Kevin who's in the fishing business also. Ryan has been tournament fishing as long as I've known him. Won numerous tournaments inshore and offshore. Uh, is uh, uh, also a guide inshore and offshore. He is a social media website guru. Handles all my website and social media work. And he's a heck of a fisherman. Hogfish. Permit and uh, snapper on the reef is a really, really hot subject right now. There's some really, really good fishing. Hogfish is a new sort of popular fish that's been discovered over the last three or four years. Ryan knows all the secrets uh, to catching these things. I've done a t couple of TV shows with Ryan. He knows what he's talking about, and I know you're going to enjoy his seminar. Captain Ryan Farner. Thank you, Bill. How's everybody doing? Good? A lot of, lot of good information today. I can tell you that. I've learned a lot <laughs> back there. Um, I'm going to start out today, we'll, we'll talk about hog snapper fishing. We'll, we'll start out real quick and we'll go over the bases because we've got a couple of species we've got to cover in a genre, but I just want to, I want to go over hog, hog snapper fishing first. First and foremost, um, your, your tackle setup. Everybody thinks you've got, you know, you go offshore, you've got to have heavy, heavy gear. This is what I hog snapper fish with. It's 15 pound test. Um, Braid, 25 pound fluorocarbon leader, and I do a one to uh, two ounce egg sinker. And if you notice, I tie like a double uni knot to the braid, so, I, so that weight will slide up and down on there. Trick is, is you want a nice fluid system. When you're, when you're fishing for hog snapper, sand fleas, Blanched sand fleas are probably one of your best baits that you can use. It's a big secret. Blanched though. Don't just buy regular frozen sand fleas. Blanched sand fleas, they stay on the line a lot longer. Blanched, blanched is, is basically like they boil. You know, it's boiled, it's flash boiled, put in there, and then fla fra flash frozen. So the shell stays a little bit, you know, harder. And when you take them offshore, I usually pack about, I usually grab about 10 bags of these. Pretty cheap. They're like two, three dollars a bag at your local bait, bait and tackle store, but make sure you find the blanched ones. And uh, do I? You want them frozen and you want to keep them cold. Don't let them thaw out like on your deck out in the sun. Keep them in like, I, grab, I have a little bag cooler, okay? And put an ice pack in it. Uh, new ice is a good one down here. You get a new ice, they sell them right down here. Fr freeze it and then put a bunch of these bags in there. Pull them out out of your bag cooler. As you use them, take Take your hook, run it right through the sand flea, right through the middle of it, very, very, very carefully. Like, if you do it too fast, it'll crack. You just want to just, nice. Well, I'm going to go over that in just a second. Um, I prefer a, like a Nautilus style circle, uh, like a J hook, kind of like that. Reason being, um, anywhere from one aught to three aught or four aught. You gotta, you gotta understand. This hog snapper is number one. Look at his jaw. You know, you can open that mouth. Will open up as wide as this is here. Basically, his mouth will open up as wide as his body is from the back of his his fin to the base of his tail. It's pretty wide. So, um, you know why they call them hog snappers? They look like the, the the nose looks like a hog. Plus, they root around on the bottom. They eat crustaceans. They're not going to, very rarely will you ever catch one using a live bait, like a thread fin or white bait, a piece of chunk bait. Very rarely will you ever catch one like that. They're, they're primarily down there eating all the crustaceans, shrimp, crabs, little reef crabs, coral crabs, anything that's, anything that's a crab. That's their favorite bait. And, you know, a sand flea is pretty much a crustacean. I mean, it's a, it's a funky looking little thing. They stink to high heavens but they love them. And you know, a lot of guys are like, oh, you gotta take 20, 30 dozen shrimp out there. Yeah, you bring shrimp, but this is the secret weapon. And you can make a cocktail. You put one of these on with a little shrimp. Uh, you know, I call it a little you know, hogfish cocktail. And I tell you what, they love it. But the point being is by using a, a bait su such as simple as this, is you keep a lot of other uh, bycatch off of there. And some might say, well, you know, I wanna catch grouper. 
No, you don't. If, and, and, and here's why. If you, when you fish these spots offshore, sure, there are groupers there. You don't want to target the grouper the same time that you're hog snapper fishing. What will happen is, is the grouper come in and they shut the bite down. So they come in, they're the, they're, they're the alphas, they shut everything down, and then you're just going to end up catching grouper. Hey, that might be fine, <laughs> you know, but... What brand is that, Brian? Uh, hook? Or no, the, the sand fleas. Oh, the sand fleas? Baitmasters. Baitmasters. Bait Ellsworth, Baitmasters. Uh, Ellsworth is a local company in, um, in uh, St. Petersburg. They ship out all kinds, most of all the chum and stuff that you buy is Ellsworth stuff, okay? Um, and they, all your, all your tackle stores have this, but you know, you go to your local tackle store and tell them you want blanched sand fleas. I buy them in a case. I buy them from my, I buy them a case at a time, and that way I stick them in the freezer, and they all come nice packaged like this, so you know you can go out and, and use them. But that's probably probably one of the best secret weapons to use is is, is sand fleas. When I start, when I do a trip for going to catch hog snapper, I always start out minimum if I've got like three people on the boat. I'm probably going to buy about 15 dozen shrimp. I mean, that's the reality of it. You got to have a lot of bait to go through because you're targeting a certain species. So you're going to catch a ton of gray snapper um, or what they call Key West grunts. They're not bad eating. Your bycatch, hog snapper fishing, is really good. You can fill, you can fill the cooler with gray snappers. You're going to catch uh, scamp, scamp groupers. You're going to catch flounders. You're going to catch trigger fish. Know your rules and regulations, though, because trigger fish and everything else, you know, they're either, they either have open or they close, and you just check your FWC. And they have a lot of good apps now to check it. They haven't put any moratoriums or closures on hog snapper yet, so that is a good thing. I'm sure that they will, but for now, um, they don't. But your bycatch that you're using, if you go out there and one guy on one side of the boat's using a sar you know, sardine or a live bait trying to catch a grouper, Forget about even, forget about it. Everybody on the boat needs to have the same rig, right? The same 25 pound test fluorocarbon leader, the same hook, and the same sinker. If you, if the current's running a little bit more, up your sinker, okay? Um, the trick is when that when that sand flea hits the bottom, I don't even want to pull one out. They smell so bad, okay? When that sand when that sand flea hits the bottom, and you've got this weight, when you let it down. Your target zones start at 40 feet of water, 35 to 40 feet of water. Any hard bottom, any ledge, doesn't matter. If you, the ledges that you go to and you catch groupers and snappers, the hog snappers are there. It, it, do, it doesn't matter. Where, where you go, they are there. It's just the trick of targeting them, you know, okay? So you get into like a good live, live bottom or a good hard bottom where the bottom's marking really hard on your machine and get in there and look for fish shows which are snappers, scamps, stuff like that, on the relief side of the brakes. When I say the relief side, you have like a ledge. Ledge drops off. I, I primarily fish either way up 25, 30 feet above on the high side of the brake, depending on how I anchor, or 20 or 30 feet past the brake, depending on how I anchor. Um, I don't use a marker jug, but it's a good idea. You guys make a cheap one, Clorox bottle, wrap some mono around it, Mark, you know, 5, 10, 15, mark one 50 foot, mark one 60 foot, mark one 80 foot, bring a couple jugs with you. You mark your, your spot, throw the Clorox bottle out, it unravels, marks your spot, and then you have a visual. When you anchor up, you know that that marker jug is 20, 30 feet in front of the boat or 20, 30 feet behind the boat, and that's where the break is. You don't ever want to anchor up right on the break because your, your predator fish, your bigger, your bigger groupers and stuff like that are there. And you will catch you know, keeper gags, keeper reds on this light tackle because you're far enough away from the break. And they will eat this stuff. They'll eat the sand fleas, but not as, you know, not as much as they will a live bait. So if you're going to target hog snapper, you want to strictly use shrimp, crabs, fiddler, live fiddler crabs are awesome as well. I couldn't find any to bring in today, but um, if, you, if you leave out of like Fort DeSoto and stuff, I don't know who sells them over here, Gulf the Bay Bait and Tackle always has live fiddler crabs on St. Pete Beach. It's the only time I ever go there to buy is live fiddler crabs. I think it's like $8 for four dozen. So they're pretty cheap too. And you can do the same kind of a thing. Fiddler crab and a shrimp, a little cocktail, it's deadly. So um, shrimp, sand fleas, fiddler crabs, wonderful bait um, to use. And your, your, your catch ratio will go up. You have to put in time though. You get on a spot, and here's, here's what I try to tell everybody. When, when you're hog snapper fishing, 
if you're catching, everybody in the boat's just catching nothing but Key West grunts and gray snappers, and you haven't caught anything else, move, right? Go to the next spot. When you start catching red groupers, little red groupers, the little ones, porgies, you, you guys know what a porgy is? Porgies and scamps, you're in the zone. You stay there. Porgies, scamps, and little red groupers, okay? I've just, over the years of doing this, when I'm on that, I'm like, it's any minute now. It's going to happen. When one eats, usually, it's how I learn, really learned this was GoPro on the bottom, on a fishing rod, GoPro, put it down on the bottom, and I watch what happens. The, the, the groupers and the snappers come in there, and they eat, you know, what's going on, you know, with whose ever bait is on the bottom, and the, you see the hog snappers. They're just cruising around the outside, and they're staying on the sand, and every time a grouper kicks his tail and it hits the sand, the sand comes up, the hog snappers go right over to it. So what I like to do is fire your bait down to the bottom, reel up, because this is this slip sinker, your bait now is way up off the bottom, okay? Reel up till you feel it hit the hook again, okay? And then let it back down slow. As soon as you feel the weight hit the bottom, rod tip, rod tip stays down. And this is how I fish them. Rod tip stays down, and you're just feeling them. As soon as you feel it, doo -doo, I'm using a, a, basically a, a hybrid circle hook, okay? So that circle hook is going to go and just, as soon as he eats it, he's rooting like hogs do. They get in the mud, and they get in the sand, and they're with their nose, and they're rooting around. That's what he does. So if your bait's two feet off the bottom or a foot off the bottom, no bueno. You're not going to catch them. It's no good at all. You might as well forget about it. You're going to catch a gray snapper or something else. So if you... Trick is, hit that bottom, the bait has to be, I mean, weight on the bottom with the bait. They don't care about the weight. They care about, they see that little shrimp and that crustacean, they come over and eat it. You're not going to have a hard bite. You're going to feel a doom, just like a snapper or anything like that, just real tight. And how you know you have a hog snapper on is he stays, he stays hooked up. And, and that rod tip, it's just, I mean, it goes crazy because this whole body, this is a fin. This is just like his tail, this is his tail, and he lays sideways, and he just it fights you. And it's an incredible fight. I mean, he, like for, for the size, that one right there will whoop your butt. That size fish right there will whoop you. It'll fight like a 15-pound gag grouper on this light tackle. And they usually run away from the break. They're not, like, they're not gonna run and try to like break you off. They run away from the break. You will get broke off sometimes because of like sea fans, coral, miscellaneous stuff that's, you know, that's on the bottom. Trick is keep the bait, I mean, an inch or two off the bottom. You're going you're gonna to go through so many shrimp and so many sand fleas. You're going to like, when am I ever going to catch one? As soon as you catch one, nobody hooting and hollering, you know, taking pictures and doing all that. Make sure you have other people that are firing baits down because that's when, you know, his brothers or sisters or whoever he's with, his clan, is hanging out, and you're going to catch multiples at the same time. If you go to a spot and catch one, don't leave. Still fish. It, it takes a while to get through there. You, you're not going to go and catch like 10 or 15 on a spot, you know, unless you really got it dialed in, you know, and, and, and they're there. Um, typically, this time of year, starting in about from October to about December, I find them really good in about 60 foot of water. Okay, that's your magic number. North of the Egmont Shipping Channel and south of the Egmont Shipping Channel. Okay, there's all kinds of bottom. You don't really need. Go pick up one of these charts that you can buy locally. Go find a good area of hard bottom, you know, and, and get in there and start working around with your boat. You don't need top secret numbers or anything. It's not rocket science. What's, rock, what, what's tough in learning it is fishing the right bait, light tackle, okay, and, and doing exactly what I tell you about, keeping the bait on the bottom and putting your time in. And the, 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 the species that you catch, the bycatch, if you're catching scamp grouper, you're catching trigger fish, you're catching porgies and little red groupers, stay there. Because that, that's, that's, that's key, is catching those, 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 those fish, tend to, those hogfish tend to be grouped, or a lot of them, where there are, those, there are those fish. If you're just catching nothing but gray snappers, move. Don't even waste your time, you know? And you only have so much time. You, know? you go out there, you get lucky you catch six or seven of them, you, you've had a really good day, you know? Um, so this time of year, typically um, 50 to 80 foot of water is really good. Uh, I fish them all the way out to 120 feet of water. Um, and I've caught some real big ones out there. It's just, you know, 
if you can get out there, if weather conditions are right, if the current's not cranking. I never, I never catch them when the current's cranked up either. It needs to be, you know, um, it needs to be like a medium current where it's not, you're not screaming because you don't have a, you have very light tackle and you have, you know, you don't want your, your, your weight all the way back there 20 yards behind the boat. So, um, go ahead, Bill. Do you, uh, do you chum for the hog snapper like you chum for maybe <clears throat> mango snapper? Or maybe no. No, and I, I don't chum for them at all because I don't want everything else. I don't want to stir anything else up that's there. I want to strictly, that's the biggest, people go, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I bought some crab chum. I'm going to use that. Well, <laughs> you're going to have 8,000 gray snappers and porgy, or, I mean, all of your bycatch, Tom Tates, all the little grunts, all the little spot tail pinfish that are on these breaks and ledges out there, they're just going to be foaming around trying to eat up all that chum. I'm a fan of no chum when you're hog snapper fishing. So keep, stay away from the chum. Um, and just go out, you, utilize that setup with those baits, and you'll be successful at it. And, and just start you know, writing down. Take a log book with you and write down, you know, on this spot, I caught nothing but you know, 20 gray snappers, caught a couple trigger fish. Because that spot, next year, we'll have fish on it. Or in a couple months, we'll have fish on it. So um, don't give up on your spots, you know, those fish move, they got tails, they, they move around. Go ahead. Whole shrimp, whole shrimp, and you want to hook the shrimp right in the back of the tail. So let's just say that that's a, tr a shrimp right there. You want to hook him, uh, maybe, uh, you got a sh DOA shrimp? Yeah, here, I'll use your, I'll use your prop. Where you want to hook these guys is, I'll retie it for you. Okay, all the shrimps, um, I personally like to hook them right in the tail. So you go right through the back of the tail, nice and clean. So that hook is... Yeah, from his, from the top? no, yeah. from his belly. Remember at the top of the shrimp, his shell comes up. Yeah, so through the, through the belly, through the top, just like that, okay? Uh, Bill actually showed me a technique um, that uh, he learned from, from, a, from an old timer where of taking and hooking the shrimp up through his, they have like plastic plates on there, you know, right up through the plate and going up right up through the heart and then through the head and keeping it just like that. It'll actually stay on for a pretty good amount of time. But when you're going through so many shrimp, it's so easy just to take the shrimp upside down and hook it and it go right, right like that on it. So, you know, have, having that hook right up through the back of that tail and right on there nice and clean like that is a perfect combination. You can put the shrimp on, then take you a sand flea, put sand flea or a, or a, um, or a fiddler crab right on top of that hook right there and make you a little combo and just let it sit. Make sure that thing is sitting right down on the bottom. I, I don't want jumbo shrimps. I don't use jumbo shrimps. Go in there and buy, number one, it's really expensive. So go in there and buy just their regular whatever count that they give you. Jumbo shrimps tend to get like a little bit bigger of a bycatch of a fish, you know, like a big grouper or something's going to eat him, something like that. So. Have you tried any live sand fleas? I, I would love to if I got the patience to go catch them yeah, things. No, I haven't, to I be honest with you. I mean, I would love to have some. I just never, you know, it's not one of these. The Blanish work really, really well. It's kind of like a secret. My brother and I really don't, you know, we don't tell a lot of people, but now everybody knows how to hog fish. So at the oh, end of the no, day. No, no, I was going to say, can we keep that secret in this room? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, that, th those, don't post it on Facebook. Th those, are, th those are real good. They're real good. <laughs> They're real. It's. It's, it's a real good secret to take with you because it's really inexpensive. I mean, for what you can buy, those, you know, you're going to go spend, you know, $50, $60, $70 on shrimp where you can spend, you know, $20, $30 bucks and have a ton of sand fleas for a couple trips. Sure. I'm going to get off uh, hog snapper fishing. We're going to go into um, yellowtail snapper fishing and mango fishing out offshore. Um, I like to start in 60, 70, 80 foot of water for these, okay, typically. Um, what, I, what I preferably like to do is 
they, uh, a lot of your local tackle shops sell this um, dry chum. It's basically Purina um, fish food is what it is, okay? And I like taking this with some, and you heard Van talk about this, some tournament chum, okay, in a box, letting the box of tournament chum fall out, okay? A box of glass minnows. You guys know what frozen glass minnows are? A box of frozen glass minnows, a box of tournament chum, and, uh, a bag of this, five gallon bucket, and get some, go to Home Depot and buy some kids play sand. You know the stuff you put in your play sand? Five gallon bucket, I make like two or three or four of these buckets. And I let them fall out a couple hours, usually night before, put them on the dock, let everything fall out. Go out in the morning, it's still cold, dump them in the bucket, dump this in there, mix it all up good with the bo bottom of your bait net, okay? Dump the sand in there. You can put oats in there, you can put whatever you want in there. But what happens is, is you create a nice little chum, okay? And you don't, you don't want it, you don't want to put any water or anything else in it. You want it like thick, like almost like it's goopy, sandy, where you can ball it up, okay? The, the trick in snapper fishing, if you want to be successful at it, is, is your chum. If you, can get your, if you can get the fish chummed up, the fishing's going to be really, really easy, okay? Um, anchoring up on a spot, same thing. Mark, marking your fish shows is everything. Find your wreck, breaks, you know, local reefs out here, uh, 70, 80, 90 foot of water. Those are your real good target zones. Uh, southwest or west of Paso Grill, St. Petersburg, and um, get in that bottom, anchor up. Now you have your chum. Your chum's already made, okay, from the morning. So you have a five gallon bucket or two of chum, full of sand, full of all of the stuff mixed together. And when you get on the spot, you simply take handfuls of it, or you can use like a ladle or whatever you want, thick, and just let it go back in the current. And as the sand drops and sinks, all those little pieces of glass minnows and the chummed up chum is all just coming out, right, as it's going down. And by the time it gets 20, 30, 40 feet down there, it dissipates out. Snappers will come up off the water column and start eating that. I, I personally like to go and net a bunch of live bait as well. So I take the live bait after I've been chumming and I throw handfuls of live bait out the back of the boat. And I'm live bait chumming, right, and it just causes you know, chaos behind the boat. And those fish are coming up. And then once you start seeing those fish come up, break out the light tackle, same setup, no, no sinker, 25 pound test fluorocarbon leader. I use a, the same rod right here, okay? I take, I take the bait, I use these, and I'll pass a couple of these around so you guys can see them. I get these out of Key West, Florida, okay? It is a, it is a hook with a lead head on it. It's got enough weight on it to, to, to flow back in the current. And this is typically what I snapper fish with right on there. I take and I take the hook on the bait, take one of those live baits, make sure I, I usually put, you know, 40, 50 dead baits in a bucket of those live baits. Usually cut them right in half, take this piece, go right up through it, just like you'd rig anything else on there, and push that, hide it down in there just like that, and let it, let it free flow back in the current. The trick is, is free lining, free lining. Like, you don't want it to be tight, okay? Meaning, if it's tight, it's back there spinning, okay? And it doesn't look like it's natural, you know? Those snappers are, they're pretty smart fish, you know? They're gonna wanna see everything that's coming down that chum line, and they're gonna eat it. And you wonder why you're not getting bit. Well, you're standing over there with a rod in your hand, you're not free lining it, you're, you're not gonna get bit. So trick is, is as you're chumming, you've got to have, it's, it's a teamwork thing here. One person is constantly, I'm not talking about every, every 30 seconds. I'm talking every, every minute or two, nice little handful of chum right behind the boat in a, in a ball. And as it flows back down in the water column, and as it flows down, you're letting your, your, your baits out. And that weight is causing it to sink, right? Sometimes you, you get them going, they'll come right up to the surface and you can, you can chum them that way. Big mango snappers the uh, uh, yellowtail snappers will come right up to the surface. And you, can, you don't even need a weight. But I like the weighted system because it gets it, it gets it down in that water line, okay? And as you're feeding it, as soon as it starts taking off and the line starts taking off, all you have to do is reel. No, there's no hook set. You don't need to be nothing like that. Just reel and come up tight and hold on to it tight. If using these hooks, they're so sharp, they hook those snappers, I mean, chances of losing them are, yeah, I mean, 
unless you got, you know, man in the gray suit is back there eating your bait, you know, <laughs> eating your fish, you, you can get them in and they fight like crazy. And it's on super light tackle, it's awesome, and every one you put in the boat is great table fare. Of course, you guys know how good snappers are. And so you can successfully go out and, and, and have a pretty good snapper session by just doing that. Go ahead. I mean, I start immediately. Usually, usually I get out there and get going. I mean, the fish, it does not take long, like a couple minutes. And if, the trick is, is nobody's running around on the boat and, and making noise and everything else. It needs to be quiet, you know, because those fish are spooky. So, and, and another thing, shut your bottom machine off, okay? Shut your bottom machine off. It's pinging, it's pinging echoes down there, and they can see. I've had more success by shutting the machine off you know, when I'm anchored up on the spot and I'm doing this, by shutting it off, they come up even higher. I get them right up to the back of the boat. I can just lay, lay a bait in the water and take, and take them, and, and you can catch one. Um, yeah. Southwest, southwest of, we use Egmont Shipping Channel as your, like, course, you know? Like, anything south of the channel, you're going to catch yellowtails. Get, you know what's a great, great thing to do? You can get the numbers or the pipeline. Any, any part, get on the pipeline, start working the pipeline. You see fish shows, not on the bottom, but you see fish shows that looks like bait that's 15, 20 feet up. Those are yellowtail snappers and mangoes, and they're up there. And you start learning to fish the moon, the moon phases and stuff like that. You get really good at it. You get it dialed in, and you don't, have, you know, you don't ever have to worry about going out there and really not catching them. You know? you, uh, the, the, the most successful times that I have doing it are, uh, are a couple days before the moon and a couple days after the moon, never on the moon. Um, and it just tends to be pretty good. And we're coming into, you know, April, May, June are really good months to do it. So you've got some good, good opportunities to get out there and, and to do some of the snapper fishing. Any time during the day, better, morning, after, all day long? Like Bill and I, we went out and filmed the show, and we had our limit in about 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, and that's the fun part about it. You don't, you don't need to make a big day out of it. Get out there in the morning, get your, catch your limit, Come on in, and you can make it early. You can be in by noon, and I do it in a bay boat. I don't need to run a big offshore boat out there. You know, weather permitting, be safe, be careful. You know, file a float plan before you go out, and 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 you'll be you'll be successful at it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I mean you can find them in 40 feet, and I just I'm giving you an idea of where you can go out there and really do good. You know. So yeah, 40, 50, sure, Swiss cheese bottom's great, eat up with mangoes. Um, you're not going to find so many yellowtails in there. Uh, yellowtails tend to like breaks and structure. Explain what Swiss cheese bottom is. Okay, Swiss cheese bottom is exactly like she's telling you. It is holes in limestone bottom that's just, it's, pot, it's basically potholes of limestone and those fish swim in and out of it. I mean, you, there's, there's like underwater tunnels, it's just a cavernous, spongy Swiss cheese bottom. It's really, really good for red grouper fishing. And you know what else sits on Swiss cheese bottom? Hogfish. <laughs> they do. On your bottom machine? Yeah. Uh, you learn. Uh, yeah, your bottom machine. Your bottom machine is, you know, don't just take your bottom machine brand new from the factory and expect that it's going to read the bottom just like you want it. You need to play around with it. Your manuals, your best friend, Go uh, Google and YouTube are your good friends too. Just go on there and Google how to set up your machine properly and what machine it is. There's all kinds of videos that'll tell you how to do it. But what you want to do is you want to be able to mark and tell the differ difference between sand bottom and hard bottom, okay? And how an easy way to tell the difference is, let's just say, here's the bottom, okay? And your, your machine is stroking, and let, we'll just go with the standard color that everybody uses, is red with like a blue background. So your bottom is red, okay? And it marks here, right? And you know when it's marking right here, and it's like this, and all of a sudden, it gets really, really, really hard. So what that, that's doing is as that sonar is pinging down, it's, it's reading that this is hard because it's mass, this is sand, and this is soft. So when you come to sand and you see a little bit of fish marks, you know, right? Right like that? On this, and they'll always be on the edge of where it gets nice and hard. 
okay, and then it fizzles out, that's a hard spot, and that's a piece of hard bottom. If it's all hard throughout the whole thing, you just grind around in the area with your boat until you find and you start looking for good little fish, fish shows or relief when it reliefs down like this. It might not look like a break, like some people think, like boom, oh, that's, you know, th that, that's a break. It reliefs down maybe one or two feet, and you'll see it'll be, the top of the break will be like sand, and then it'll get real, real, real hard here. What happens is, is these are all like little undercuts up underneath there and stuff like that on the relief. You'll see fish marks right up in here. That's where you want to fish. You want to be anchored up, that, back your boats want to be right here, currents fishing to where the fish are. Okay, and you get if you anchor up right on top of it, and your current's running back here, what are you going to be catching? Nothing. Nothing. So yeah, it's all about. It's not always like that. Okay. It's not always like that. It's not always like a textbook thing here. It's <laughs> you know it's it, it's it's sometimes it's it's different. So you have to kind of plan for it. If you're if the way you anchor up your boat with wind and current, you know, means everything. You know where that spot is. So I don't I don't use a jug or anything like that, but. I suggest that you do because what will happen is it will teach you. And learn your compass. So look at your compass. Look at your heading, how your boat's setting. Sometimes it's good just to get in the area, anchor up, and you're going to see how you're going to sit with the wind and the tide. And if you remember it in your head, right, I, I t your best friend's a pencil. Take a pencil and write down your heading that you're, you're sitting at, right? And that way you know, hey, i got to go and anchor up at this heading and for order me to sit on the spot. Mark your spot. You see it? Throw the jug over. Go up, anchor, come back. I don't throw a jug because I'm back snapper fishing and I don't want my snappers. I might put a live bait out on the top on a, on a balloon for a kingfish, you know, a tuna, blackfin tuna or something like that. I don't, I don't want the jug back there. So sometimes I'll throw out with a, like a grouper rig and catch the jug and bring it back to the boat and reel it up, get away with it. But it'll, it'll help you really get good at anchoring and finding your zone for your heading and how you sit to, to catch these fish on the bottom. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move off. Anybody have any other questions about snapper fishing? I'm going to get into probably one of the, my favorite things to do is, is permit fishing, okay? And right now the permits have showed up, all right? And, and they're on all the wrecks. You're not going to go catch permits on hard bottom, okay, or breaks. You're going to catch them on wrecks. Um, they're a, uh, they, they get on these wrecks in big schools and they, their whole day is spent milling around the wrecks. You know, there's really no how they do it. I, haven't, I have never figured out, like, which direction they go around the wreck. They're just on the wrecks, okay? So this time of year, everybody knows love bugs show up. What else shows up? The tarpon. It's usually when the love bugs show up, the tarpon shows up, and, uh, and so do these guys. Pass crabs, okay? These, these are your best friend. You want to catch permit? You know, it's, we, we, don't, we don't live down in the Keys where you can sight fish, fish, you know, stalking them on the flat, you know, with a fly or something like, like, like that. You go, to, you go to any one of your bridges, preferably near passes, that come off of a bay that has a lot big grass flats. What happens is, is the crabs flush. They come right out, and they'll be up on top of the water, flushing out with the outgoing tide. You're not going to catch crabs on the incoming tide. You're going to catch crabs on the outgoing tide, okay? How do you catch them? Well, I just so happen to have a net. So it's, it's, it's a two-man operation. I mean, I do it by myself, but I spend days do going out there. I'm actually going to start next week. Like, um, I'm going to start dipping crabs. And I go out there in the evening times on an outgoing tide, you know, and one person driving the boat, get on the edge of the tide lines, like out by Egmont, like the north tip of Egmont, any one of your bridges, like by the Pinellas Bayway, uh, uh, the ten cent bridge going over to to uh, to Terra Verde, and also the Bunces Pass bridge going over to Fort DeSoto. Those are great places because you got big grass flats, and all of them come underneath. So you just start at the bridges, and you'll see all the boats in the afternoon. They're dipping crabs to go tarpon fish. But you can stand up on the front of the boat. I get two crab dippers up on the front of the boat, and I stand in the back and drive, and they're up there. And you just dip, dip, dip. You want to have a nice little pair of uh, pliers, okay, with you. Um, not dikes, but just pliers. And the trick is, is you get three or four crabs in there in your net. You reach down in there. Be careful; they hurt, they'll pinch you. And you just grab, grab on to their claw, pull them out, right, and just barely squeeze. Don't crunch it. They will eject 
their, cl their claw automatically. Okay? The crab will eject his claw automatically. If you take and you pop him off, you break it, you're going to kill the crab. Okay? So you don't want to do that. You want to just barely grab on any one of the joints on that thing. As soon as you get one off, then turn over here and grab the other one off. He, he'll, he'll eject his claw. Okay? Um, once, you've, once you've done that, he goes in the live well. So you keep a five-gallon bucket full of you know, n claws, and then everything goes back in your live well are non-clawed crabs. All right? How I hook my crabs when we fish, uh, I did tell you you're only going to catch the crabs on the outgoing tide. Uh, closer to the moon phases is really good, and it's, crabs are flushing now. Permit fishing is really good. So, you know, it's the time of year to do this stuff. Um, so take advantage of it. it. Every week it gets better and better and better. Go ahead. Um, I tell you what, go to St. Pete Beach Reef. has permit all over it. Uh, the Seven Mile Reef off Bradenton, the go by a chart, all the places that anywhere out to 80 feet of water, if it's a public wreck, they're on there. Okay? They're on there. Uh, the Betty Rose, you know? What's the, what's the, old, what's, what's the uh, old nickname for the Betty Rose? The permit barge. It's like that for a reason. Back when I was, I was full-time guiding, um, when I was uh, 19, 20 years old, I would go out there and anchor up on the Betty Rose and stand up on top of my hardtop, and I'd, there'd be 200 fish out there. And, the, and the, the, the charter boat captains would be trolling hardware, catching kingfish all around me, and I'd be sitting right on the wreck in the middle, and I'd stand up on the top of the hardtop, and I'd see the fish coming around. The permits, you just see, you see they're like little tails and fins come out of the water. And I mean, these things are big. You know, they're not, these Gulf permit are big permits, you know. And you'll see them up there on the top water milling around. Trick is, when you hook your crab, you whittle your hook through. You don't just pop your hook through. You get this nice sharp hook, you go through the, I'll pass this around through the corner, come up through the bottom of the base of the crab to the top of the shell. And you take that hook and just kind of twist it in your hand and work it through like a needle right through a shell. If you push it too hard, it'll crack it, okay? Three aught, four aught, 40 pound test fluorocarbon leader, okay? 40 pound test fluorocarbon leader. I use Seaguar. Uh, Ohiro makes a really good uh, leader too. 40 pound test leader. And I do not permit fish with the stuff that I fish with there. These guys are bruisers. This is what we fish with, okay? A good seven foot rod, something you can cast one of those crabs pretty good, and a reel with a really good drag system. Okay, nice smooth drag system, and I, and, I, and I run 40 pound braid, okay? I load it with 40 pound braid. Trick it, permit will take you right into the wreck, and they will break you off, okay? And they will laugh at you, and you will, let me tell you something, they fight like crazy. They have a big, huge, broad body like a top of a big garbage can lid in the water with big, massive tail on it. <laughs> permit, Ryan? Yes, sir. That away. They're tough fighters. You and notice how he walks us in a circle? They will get you in the wreck too, won't they? Oh yeah. You throw your crab out there, he eats it, come wind tight, no hook set. Remember, you're using a, a modified circle hook, a Nautilus style circle hook. Here, pass that around so everybody can see it. Um, do you ever use his fake bait? Right? Do I ever use fake bait? No. Have I caught them on other things other than crabs? Big, big shrimp. Big, big shrimp. Can you small blue crabs too? Sure. Sure. Small blue crabs are fine. But the trick is that size of crab is like perfect. You don't want them too big, you know? Right. And another good thing to do also is taking them, like if you have bycatch from crabs, there's a bunch of places that sell crabs. You can go buy like blue crab, steamed blue crabs. Go to those local fish markets and stuff and ask them for all their scraps, okay? For real. And take those scraps, put them in the bottom of a bucket, take the bottom of your bait net, and beat them all down and chum them all up. And just put some of that crab stuff out the back of the boat. Ellsworth also makes a crab chum, okay? Now, it, it smells, you know, permit, 
that, that, that smell. Put a chum bag off the back corner of the boat. Okay, they sell these downstairs. You get, get you a good chum bag, you buy the good crab chum, put it in there, hang it off the back cleat of the boat, let it just flow right in the current while you're anchored up, waiting for the permits. Well, I've had them come right up to the back of the boat smelling the stuff, okay? With little pieces of crab, legs and stuff like that, just right behind the boat, keeping them going, and you float a nice live uh, crab, and he's swimming with his flippers right on there. They cannot resist it. They love it. They love it. It's, uh, it, really is, uh, it really is fun, e even to watch them like, bite it when you can see the fish and you, you cast to them. You don't ever want to cast on top of them. You want to present your bait in front of them, whichever direction they're coming. If you don't see them, it's okay. You don't need to see the fish. You go to most of these wrecks and anchor up and free line this crab into the current behind the boat. You're going to get bit. Um, there's, if you're not getting, if you're not getting bit, it's, it takes, I mean, I might sit there sometimes for an hour and just wait, but as soon as they come around and they get in the zone, they're not going to turn that crab down at all. Is that a 4,000 size? Zone? That actually is a Cabo, this is actually a Cabo 60, but you can, Cabo 50, something similar to this setup right here, okay? You can pass that around if you want. Something so similar, permit, permit actually are very good eating. Um, I, uh, I tend to, to release most of mine unless my customers want one, but they're, believe it or not, they're really, they're really good eating. Um, 40 pound braid, 40, 50 pound fluorocarbon leader, three to four aught, um, circle hook or a Nautilus style J hook that's a circle hook. You want that circle because you want that hook set in the corner of the mouth. They, they're crab crushers, so they have a sandpapery, hard, abrasive mouth. You want to have a hook set in the corner of their mouth. You want a super sharp hook. So don't go be, you know, spend the money, buy good hooks, okay, that are extra super sharp, and your success rate on these things will go up, you know. You don't want to use a straight style, style, style hook. You want a circle hook or something like that. Um, anybody have any questions? Are you using 40 pound braid for your main line? 40 pound braid, yeah. Um, permit have extremely good eyesight. So how I, how I like to judge it is I take off the spool like this. That's what I use. So I'm six foot two, about six foot of line. Tie a double uni to your braid. Nice, clean, efficient so you can throw it. No swivels. Don't be doing that. They're going to see it. They have really, really good eyesight. You're fishing offshore, clear, clear waters. I did really well this year on St. Pete Beach Reef when it was muddy and dirty. They were there, you know, and catching some big ones, 35, 40 pounders. Yeah, multiple fish like that right there. I mean, you're looking at the beach, catching them on there. Right now off of uh, Bradenton, Anna Maria, all those little wrecks, not reefs, wrecks, all those wrecks that are public have permanent on them right now, every one of them. So trick is, is getting the crabs, you got in order for you to catch the crabs, you've got to catch them the day before, or you got to catch them on the outgoing tide in the morning. Okay. Uh, I also do really good on the major and minor periods. You guys fish the salooner table and the major and minors. That's when you want to fish them too. So sometimes I might not leave till one o'clock in the afternoon. I'll roll out there and I'll fish. Uh, I'll fish a major and a min I'll fish the major in the afternoon or the minor in the morning. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, either or. So. Um, Permit fishing. Sometimes you can use chum. Uh, if if it's if it's if it's available at your local tackle shop, make sure it's crab chum. Nothing else other than crab chum because they are again a crustacean eater. Okay, these guys like and don't be afraid too of going out there with some big old jumbo shrimps. Okay, and hooking those shrimps. I hook them in the tail. Same kind of a same kind of a deal. Right in the back of that tail. Launch them out there and let them just flow with the current. You know, leave your, your bail on your, your reel open and let him just flow right out there. If he's back there just spinning in the current, that permanent ain't going to eat him. Same thing with the crab. You know, when you're throwing it out there, you want to have that bail open and you want to be feeding it. It looks like a natural presentation. And believe it or not, one of those little pass crabs and, or little baby blue crabs, he'll peel line off. You know, he'll peel line off. You just keep that line right in your hand. You'll feel it. You know when you get bit because you can feel it with the braid. You feel it with the braid. Um, another good thing is... Get a big landing net, okay? I, I, there's 
they have plenty of really good f collapsible folding landing nets. A 40 pound permits like this and about that big. Like he's just, you know, just how do you even grab that, you know? Big landing net. Open it up, right in there. It's, it, w it's, it's proper to practice catch and release with these things. Yes, you can eat them, but it's more for a game fisher in the sport, okay? If you don't know how to clean a permit, you better, you better learn how before you kill one because you're not but butchering a part. They have massive rib cages. You got to know how to cut them. So my suggestion to you for permit fishing would be pull him up out of the water, take a beautiful picture of him, and then revive him and let him go. You know, it's such a beautiful fish, and they fight. And let me tell you something, they will wear you out. I mean, a 40-pound permit, even on that setup right, right there, you'll stay on them for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes sometimes on a, on a big one. And there are some big fish out there. Trick is, too, is throw your anchor ball, or when you anchor up on these wrecks, get a buoy ball, okay? You know, you guys, like when you tarpon fish, you know, get, hook up with a tarpon, you throw your ball out, you've already been anchored, same principle of permit fishing. You need to get that permit off that wreck and motor him with the boat, get him off that wreck. If you're anchored right up on the wreck, he's going to take you right down to the wreck, and you are not going to stop him. I, don't, I mean, unless you really put the wood to him, you're not going to stop him. So you're moving the boat when you get him off. I hook up and I move the boat. Yeah, I throw the thing, fire it up, try to get him as far off of that wreck as possible uh, in order to, uh, to catch him, you know. And that would be my advice, you know, for you. And pick your days. Don't go out there when it's nasty. Go out there when, you know, it's 10 knots or less, you know, and it's nice. Um, unless you've got a big boat. I find doing it out of my bay boat is, is more enjoyable because I stand up on top of the console and good pair of polarized glasses um, uh, so you can see. And you'll see the differences in the water, and that's typically where those permits are going to be. So, um, if you guys have any questions, I'll be hanging around around here and pick my brain, no problemo. Oh, I picked this up in there. It's probably the best look. I think I'm going to have to buy a couple of these today. I think they're probably the best. Savage crab, best looking crab I've ever seen. Savage crab, he's got them downstairs. And they come with a hook set, already pre-weighted and stuff like that. I think I'm... Yeah, sure. Anybody else? Captain Ryan Farner, thank you, Ryan. Good job.